familia. This is Ray Collazo, and you're watching and listening to the Founding Translation Talk Show. The talk show that tells truth about politics and today's hottest issues. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you again if you're watching. First of all, if you're watching live, either on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube live, we're going to have you on today's show. Um, and uh, we encourage you to share this content with your friends, as well as the continued conversation we're having about how to support our loved ones, friends, and family, and community, especially the most vulnerable during this COVID-19 season. This is your host, Ray Cuyasso. Thank you again so much for joining us. And for my podcast listener, my rider dies, always, always a pleasure to have you part of the show on the audio side, as well as as a radio program at WPPM 106.5 FM, FM in Philadelphia, the city loves you back, People Power Media. We're going to hear from a panel of experts and activists who are members of the Pennsylvania Governor's Advisory Commission on Latino Affairs, who are going to share with us what the state is doing and what are some of the, the, the resources available to the Latino community, and indeed all relatives of Pennsylvania, but particularly those that may have, um, that traditionally are amongst the most disadvantaged and hard to reach populations in our society. We want to make sure everyone is protected safe, but also is protected. Uh, their children are protected and protected from an economic safety net perspective in these very challenging times. So you are watching and listening Ray Coyazzo, Tulai Piccarelli, and the Found in Translation family on Found in Translation Talk Show. If you're watching live, please leave us a, um, your questions uh, or your comments just down below. And thank you so much for participating in our show last week. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Oh, no. Yeah, no, we had a lot of fun. And, you know, there's just too much to do on this show. And, you know, we uh, Zulai has been reminding us to make sure if you already have it, you got to get on the census thing. And I know and and maybe when we get some time next week, we had a we both shared a very interesting experience for Latinos. The census form is a little funky um, and sort of brings up race in a very clunky way. So I know that's something people are concerned about. So but we have to, it's very important that people complete the census. Um, if you already have it now, if you haven't by now, they may, well, whenever they start knocking on doors, they may start calling it out and emailing it or remind you. Um, so we want people to continue to, to, it's very important. And I was um, under the impression that there was an extension to the census. I would imagine there has been. Yeah. Maybe. August 14th. Uh, and, and, and you know what? Our guests can confirm that um, awesome. in terms of the online version. So I want to bring uh, Teresa back in this conversation and Teresa, thank you again for being a part. Apologize for the technical glitches, but um, I want to actually bring you and one of our very special guests. We are very honored to have a, uh, our next panel is a group. Some of the great leaders we have in our community, really great public servants, all of them um, who are members of the Pennsylvania governor's advisory commission on Latino affairs. I want to shout out the executive director of GACLA, a great friend to the show, Luz Colon. And so they're going to come on the show to talk about all the resources available and how we're supporting people in any language, no matter what language they speak in Pennsylvania around the re the very various resources that we need, that we have related to this supporting our folks, uh, particularly the most vulnerable during the COVID-19 season. But there's one panelist in particular that wanted to have get on air with specifically with Teresa together, a, one of our great community treasures um, and a, a legendary activist, a public servant uh, and member now of the Governor's Advisory Commission on Latino Affairs, Ida Castro. Ida, buenas noches. Yo la bendiga. ¿Qué tal, Rey? Buenas noches. Good evening. Debe decirte, to that I'm going to tell you something that, that you don't, you're not going to remember, but it made a big impact on my life. So when I met Ida Castro at the time, she was, and people with most, na our national leadership would remember when she was the director of the EOC for this country. I mean, one of the highest ranking Latinas ever in the history of our federal government under the Clinton administration. Teresa Ida was a, was an Obama appointee. So you share that in common. And so I was working for the United States Hispanic Leadership Institute at the time out of Chicago. And so I was in charge of like mm -hmm. staffing either. So like make sure she had her water and, you know, <laughs> and basically just serve her whatever she needed. Right. So I said, oh, con gusto, right. This is like, you know, we a great Myra of hers. So I go over to her and I start helping her out. I said, oh, do you need a pen? Do you need a water? She goes, she goes, ¿De qué parte de Puerto Rico es su familia? I said, bueno, mi mami de Orocovi. She goes, seguro que sí, porque tú tienes espíritu de estilo de un jíbaro, papá. Tú, tú tienes esa sangre de los gente humilde del campo. So, so you spotted me very well. Uh, but, and I know my mom did good. Ida Castro, welcome to Found Translation. Gracias, gracias. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. What a legend, what a legend. Teresa Tron, of course, also still with us. Before we get to the rest of the panel, I wanted to ask these two women, Zulai, this question together. 
And again, you could take this however you want to take it, but I, I thought it was important. These are two women, two Latinas who, have, who have, are part of a very small sorority of Latinas who have been presidential appointees on the on some of the highest levels of our country, public service. And, you know, they've been in federal administrations dealing with all sorts of crises and all sorts of issues. And I just wanted you all to reflect, not so much even, just, just your reflections on now as outsiders observing, obviously supporting on some level, as advocates though, just your mm-hmm. reflections on this moment in history, either let's start with you, just observing what's happening, knowing knowing how it is on the other side, when you're on the other side trying to tackle these issues from a federal government perspective, just either just your reflections on this moment. Well, I've been uh, observing everything that's been going on, um, really con la boca abierta, um, quite frankly, quite surprised uh, at what seems to be, I don't know, uh, a slowness to act, right? Um, Not because necessarily you're being measured, but because I sense concern, maybe even being scared to annoy the White House. Um, When I served in the Clinton administration, uh, I had a couple of positions in addition to chairmanship of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I started as the head of the workers' compensation program. Uh, So we represented what we dealt with, 3 million employees and Oklahoma City bombing happened. Mm. So, you know, that was a federal building. Uh, everyone in that building and in surrounding buildings, because it was a cluster of federal employees, uh, were affected. And all of that, of course, fell on the lap of my agency. At the time, I had really all of the support and all of the freedom to do what was necessary to serve the families and the individuals that were survivors, right? Because workers' comp really deals with the survivors um, and their families. Um, And I was able to change rules, change regulations. I reported directly to Secretary Robert Reich um, and to members of the White House. And all I got was all the support in the world. Here, it's a different situation, right? Um, what The involvement of the president during the bombing was one of really comforting the country, right? Allaying the fears and looking at enforcement in terms of finding who did it and what happened. So it's it's very different today because what one sees publicly is contradictions in approach, is confusion at times, and it's attention to matters that are not necessarily in the best interest of the American people. COVID-19 is serious business. Those that become ill are really at peril, right? We never know who's going to walk away fine and who we will not see again. So this is a time where we need to be more together than any time that I can recall in my lifetime. I never thought I would be living through situations that we are living now. I am really concerned about my folk, los Latinos, Eh, because we are very gregarious. No le hacemos caso a nadie. Yeah, this is a right? tough cultural uh, one. This is a tough ask for our mm-hmm. folks. There's no question mm-hmm. about Muchacho, it. Yeah. We know all of the solutions, right? Doctor says one thing, you, and we say, ah, no, pero eso yo puedo hacer otra cosa. We're always trying to look at things from an entirely different perspective. No, neither, and we're... And we're going to we're going to talk about this in a moment ah, in more okay. in depth with the panel. But I just to that point, it's not just about our natural gregariousness, but it's also about we have people that are isolated and we have people that yeah. we're caregiving from a distance. And how do you support them 
when in fact you could be a danger to them hypothetically because we obviously most of us don't know if we have it or not we're carrying it so there's a lot of issues we want to get into the rest of the panel but i wanted to give Teresa charand who's been so gracious with her time this evening not only as a parent advocate but someone obviously who's paying very close attention to what's going on with COVID-19 just to give us Teresa your final thoughts if you wanted to finalize the conversation about autism or or, or just piggyback on either's uh, comments sure. uh sort of looking at this historically so just want to give you a chance mm-hmm. to say a few final words sure thank you I think on the prior conversation, I think we all decided that there's a lot more to discuss, right? I mean, it's, it's, there, there's so many layers and I think parents have, there's so many different dynamics at play. And so I, it's great. I'm so thrilled that you're going to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Open this it up for just, people this to have just a, the a beginning. Dialogue. I mean, you know, there's just so much mm-hmm. we have to get into. No question. Sure. Sure. And in terms of the, you know, where we are with this administration, I will say, you know, my first position in the administration was in the office of presidential personnel. Our position was always people are policy. The right people in the chairs are going to do the right thing for the people. If it's, if it's allocating funds, if it's allocating resources, if it's sharing information, if it's helping them build their businesses, whatever it may be, that was key. And I think where, you know, we can all have our own opinions and there are many to be had about the current administration. I think one of the biggest downfalls was the fact that people were not in the right places preparing for what could be. Um, you know, we had, people that were handling FEMA. And of course, there's, that is just, you can just pretty much put it on your calendar. Every couple of years, something's going to pop, right? You yeah. need to make sure that you have somebody in the right place. You have- no, you And that guy right running place. FEMA now, I wouldn't hire him to to run my bakery. I mean, that guy, Gate Rayner, I mean, he's a joke. My God. <laughs> well, I mean, he was acting. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's beyond me because the Obama administration was so deliberate in making sure not only we found the right people, we ran them through ethics. We knew that they were going to do the right things when time came. We knew what we were dealing with and what we could call upon them to do. And I don't get the sense, not to put a blanket statement out there, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of appointees under this administration. They're doing it for the right reason. However, unfortunately, it's being shrouded by the fact that government shrunk to a point where now it's detrimental. Um, la- layered upon that, which Ida was saying, is that there needs to be a level of trust, not only bet- between the people in the administration that could say, I need to call in the president or the vice president's office or the AG to get what we need to get done. Right now, there is no level of trust between the administration itself and those, the governors, the mayors, the, anybody at the local level. There is, everybody's kind of out there blindly just doing what they think is the right thing to do. And I think that was the biggest detriment for this president was to say, oh, we don't need to fill that position. We don't need to do that. We'll make do. We're going to cut, you know, funding. I, I think that was his biggest mistake. Well, there were many, but that was one of the, the big mistakes. And unfortunately, if you don't have people in there that are capable of reacting and thinking through resources and who can I call upon and who's going to have my back when I do this, you know, it's you're starting so far behind. Well, all I can say is this, is that if when you have people like Ida Castro and Teresa Charan running things, you got you got things in good. You got you're 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 connecting with the right kind of leadership and the right kind of perspective. And thank you, Teresa. You're going to come back. Really appreciate your 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 willingness your graciousness to share your personal story and how we support best of your children especially i'm mad it, it even gets crazier with this whole situation that's another conversation we need to have we definitely could have you back very soon and again thank you so much for your leadership and and thank you for keeping enrique in check i mean that you deserve a gold <laughs> star for that anyway. so anyway <laughs> what a, the one draining the the wi-fi right now that's oh like yeah, yeah you know you know he, he needs to <laughs> watching listen. chiefs reruns <laughs> yeah something like that anyway so that's it, Karan, thank, thank you. you so much you're always always a pleasure to have you on the show and I, either I know you you got your whole crew with you, so I know they've been very patient. So let's start getting them on the show. Well, so I don't know that it's my crew, but I I'm in good company. There's no question about it. So let's just get some people here, some people to announce. Damari will be with you in a quick second, but um, but we have uh the executive director of Aklama, one of our local community organizations in Pennsylvania, great advocate, Venezolana. Thank you. Yes, and That's uh, right. and a member of uh of of Gakla, Nelly Jimenez. N- Nelly, welcome to the to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming um, me to the show. I'm very excited to be here and ready to talk about, you know, the different issues and the different actions that the governor have taken to make sure that every single Pennsylvania is taken care of. Every single Pennsylvania, including the approximate million Latinos that live in the state of Pennsylvania. That's right. You people in San Diego and in Tucson, Arizona, El Paso, Texas, Washington, say, I want me young allá. Yes, we are a growing yes. population with a lot of history here as well. So, and actually, all of us different have, have lived in different parts of the state as but well. We, so, 
Yes. But Ray, we need to do the census. Otherwise, we can prove, we can talk a lot. But if Very important. That's right. If we don't Very fill out important. the census, then how are we going to count and how are so, we going to prove that we so, are one Nelly, just jump in there because there was there was supposed to be a period that was supposed to end yesterday where we were supposed to do it online. Now, now has that been extended? Update people how they can get engaged with the census. Yeah, so it has been extended to August 14. So, but in reality, uh, what we want is to really encourage people to be able to fill out the census online. Um, before there were different phases that people have to, you know, that if you didn't fill it online, then you will have people coming to your house and knock at your door, what they call the enumerators. But with the changes now, we want to really motivate people to fill out the information not only online, but they can do it over the phone, which it has been a very good way to help people that may not feel comfortable with the computer to complete the census. We just have to make sure that we let people know that that's an option. I can keep talking. <laughs> I'm frozen. Zulai, you got to oh, jump in there, my friend. I, no, no, I no, jump in there. This. I just saw this. Nelly, it's so good to see you. Thank you so good much for see. that. Um, Adrian, can you please introduce yourself and how, how is it that you're helping um, our folks during COVID? Adrian, you are muted. You are muted right now. Um, yes, I am. I can hear you now. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I'm, Hi. I'm getting used to muting myself in all the virtual meetings just in case. Um, but I'm also a member of GACLA, um, Adrián Rivera Reyes. My professional background is I am a scientist. I have a PhD in cell and molecular biology, and I work currently as a scientist, but also um, a community advocate and organizer um, in many ways in the Philadelphia area. Um, right now, We've been um, through other groups, including a group that I helped form here in Philly called Philly Boricuas. We started a social media channel um, that's basically to share information in Spanish. Uh, and it's for anyone and everyone, uh, you know, all over Pennsylvania, but also all my family that lives in Trenton, New Jersey, I added them all there. So they're getting information and it's just for anyone who would like to get information in Spanish. And as of two days ago, I started reading through the press releases um, and, the, and taking on the press conferences that the Governor Wolf has been doing daily and just summarizing them and synthesizing them and just putting out videos out there with some of that important information that he and his administration and department have been um, giving out to people, but in Spanish as well. That's a yeah, really, like, really great initiative for you to have started. Thank you. Yeah, and no, I mean, it's part of GACLA. It's something that I was, um, I was in conversations with uh, our executive director, Luz, and we were trying to do it in different ways and at the end of the day we just decided to do it the way that we're doing it right now just because of how easy it was to manage it that way um but yeah but today i also gave a shout out to el censo so i'm glad that nelly's here because she can really speak about that um and we really really need our people to to do that and now that we are under quarantine at our homes the entire state the entire commonwealth we have time to sit down and do that as well. Thank you so much for that. Nelly, did you want to add something? No, no, no. I was just following what he was saying. I, I think that sometimes people, eh, because of the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, we have uh, redirected our energy towards a lot of the coronavirus information and efforts. And we have forgotten that part of why we are not going to receive enough money or the money that we deserve is because in 2010 we didn't count everybody we had a very big hole and now we are right here in the middle of the pandemic trying to answer 
the questions, um, motivating people to fill out the census. And we, if something happened, like you were mentioned, every two years something's going to happen or someone mentioned in the program, then what's going to happen later? So we have to think about this is not only for here, this is, on, this is going to impact us in the next 10 years. Also, we have to understand that our demographic has changed and we have more and more Latinos living in the PA, right? So we have to make sure that we or I'll count it. So when um, the federal government uh, it, it decides to uh, send the, the resources, we get uh, what we deserve. And also representation in the Congress. We need voices in, in Congress that represent all of us. And if we lose one of the chairs, which we do, we did in the past, then who's going to be in Congress and representing our state. So we have to make sure that everybody's counted. Nelly, allow me to introduce Dr. Damari Bonillas, Bonilla Rodriguez. Welcome to our show today. Thank you. Please. Sure. Tell us about your work and, and what you've been doing to support the community during COVID. Thank you so much. Well, I'm also a GACA commissioner. Pleased to be here with my fellow commissioners and with Ray, who I've worked with for some time. I represent the Poconos region. We are often disenfranchised and disconnected from the bigger cities and funding and resources. So a situation like this, where we're in such a uh, in a global crisis and such a delicate situation, it's more important to be connected to my colleagues and, and leadership. The commissioners for GACLA are the eyes and ears of the governor on the front lines. And we have been working together to ensure that access, our community has access to information in Spanish and accurate information, being sure that people understand the dynamics around the crisis, being sure that our communities understand the social distancing component and why can't they hang out together, as um, Ray alluded to earlier on the show, it, it's against our cultural nuances and norms not to be together, not to hug, not to connect in that in that way. And so there's a level of understanding that we need to ensure that our community has by just being sure that they have access to Spanish language materials, that it's accurate, that they're not being um, misled in any way. I'm also the um, a representative of the East Strasburg Area School District School Board, the first Hispanic ever elected in the school uh, district's history. And so I'm an important liaison for our community, again, to ensure that there's a voice. Um, one of the things that we've been doing in our school district is ensuring that students have meals, um, not just lunch for today, but breakfast for tomorrow, not just coming to the school to pick up the meals, but also that we're dropping them off and we're the, the only school district in the area far and wide that is bringing meals to the bus stops where kids are normally dropped off and picked up because we know that um, uh, minority communities are working on the front lines and some parents are not home, right? So their kids can't even get to the schools to pick up the meal. So there are a lot of dynamics that the Latino community is facing at this time in this crisis. What types of support uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Bonilla, that the community is in need of currently? Well, uh, in addition to the language materials, we've been just realizing that people just need this kind of space and this kind of forum. So I've been part of several opportunities to record YouTube videos with local press. I've been quoted in the local paper, just access, access to information, access to materials, mm -hmm. resources such as unemployment information, so being sure that they understand what, what are the application processes looking like right now for unemployment, for SNAP benefits, government benefits. Our small businesses are suffering regardless of whether they're Latino-owned business or not. But when you add those language barriers and dynamics, it's even more delicate. So being sure that they understand what help is coming, how to access that help, being sure that they understand how to stay away and, and prevent being scammed, right? How to stay away from inaccurate information and those that are taking advantage of, of our communities at the moment. Um, and just honestly that it's going to be okay, but that we need to work on things together and what is happening on their behalf. Being a voice for the community and helping people work through some of those fears. Um, things like, honestly, spiritual support, regardless of what your beliefs are, people are really in need of faith over fear. And, and so um, we have online prayer groups and opportunities for people to come together and, and learn that there's some hope and that there are a lot of us that are fighting for them. Um, even if we're not in Harrisburg every day, we're connected to Harrisburg, we're connected to 
the big cities and the resources. So we're pushing out information on social media through text messages, teaching people how to use technology like this, right? Because so much of us depend on it right now to stay connected and our community doesn't have the information or the access. Some of our parents don't even have internet and talking about homeschooling and now parents becoming the teachers, we've had to teach them how to use the computer, make sure that the school districts are providing computers for use at home, um, that there's free internet available to help them if they don't have it. And that if they don't have access to any of those resources, they have paper um, materials. So we started virtual school on Monday and it's been a challenge and we've given our community two weeks as an opportunity to kind of get our feet wet and figure out how is it it's going to work with the governor announcing this week that schools are closed w without a date, right? It's indefinite right now. There is a lot at stake at the moment, and I know we can't cover it all in, in the, the hour that, that we've been on together, but there's a lot of work to be done. There definitely is. Um, Adrian, can you share uh, where can we find Philly Boricuas? Is there a page um, available yes. on Facebook? Tell us. Yes, so there is a Facebook page called Philly Boricuas. There is an Instagram, but there's also the um, the group that we formed, and it's a public group, and it's called Coronavirus Recursos para la Comunidad, and that's the channel that's fully in Spanish that everyone can just go there and post. Um, we do try and keep an eye for information that we don't think is, Can you say that again, the name of the group, Coronavirus? Yes. Recursos para la comunidad. ¿Todo seguido o una sola palabra? No. Uh, no, split. Like, uh, okay. Recursos para la comunidad. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to find... Okay. I, if I, when I find that, um, if it has a handle, I'll send that so it's shorter. But yes, but basically, we're through there, we're just sharing information in Spanish and a lot of what's been shared is, um, you know, it's more also to build support, right? Not only information, but um, people can just go there, support each other in, in different ways, be it, you know, um, by, by sharing positive things that they themselves are going or, you know, or just finding a familia, really, right, of people virtually that are all over the state that we're going through this together. Um, and that we really need to uh, stay at home. Um, to piggyback on what uh, Damari was saying, the governor and the Department of, uh, I'm blanking on the name now, economics, but they sent a press release saying that for businesses, they've extended the deadline to apply um, to be considered a essential or life-sustaining business until tomorrow, Friday. So for business owners in the community that, you know, meet the, any of the criteria, they have until tomorrow to go online to pa.gov and uh, put their business through there so that they can get, um, you know, labeled as an essential business that can remain open during this as well. Okay, and by the way, I'm back. This is Ray Cuyasso, the host of the show. It's July Piccarelli. July, I know you're not a sports person, but does the name Will, Willie Hernandez mean anything to you? <laughs> Sad. That is a Puerto Rican don't know about. So anyway, Willie Hernandez was the greatest Puerto Rican relief pitcher. So relievers come out the bench and save the game. So you were the Willie Hernandez of this show because the technical glitch. <laughs> I got thrown off the, the, the side of the boat. And you came in and did a great job. So, I, you know, you know, there's no worse feeling than missing found in translation. And you're the host of the show. So I missed a couple of minutes rebooting my computer. So if you skip, if you got into this, I apologize. But I wanted to get Ida Castro back in this conversation because Ida, I know, you know, you're one of the great health advocates we have in our country, frankly. And, you know, there are so much. Can you touch on? And again, if you touched on some of this, if you could just please. Uh, let us know if there's something that we're missing that's really important. Like the health piece is just how do we support our people just across the board, but particularly our more vulnerable that have either, you know, their access to health care is very limited to begin with. So just any thoughts and anything specifically we should know about the state's efforts to uh, to to provide as much health equity as we can in this challenging situation. 
Well, here in Pennsylvania, we've been very fortunate to have the leadership of Governor Wolf and also the leadership of our Secretary of Health. They have been extremely assertive in moving forward, trying to prevent uh, the spread, the undue and rapid spread of COVID-19. Uh, I've been very impressed with the fact that, for example, the Secretary of Health now has live, you know, updates and has actually Spanish captioning. So we should know that so that we can make sure that our parents, our tios, our aunts, and everybody that may not speak English that well can read and really learn what is going on. Because I, I believe that, yes, we're gregarious, our culture is strong, we love to hang out, nos gusta los chistes, la bachata, all that stuff. But facts are facts, and health is key for all of us, and particularly for our loved ones, right? So we have, as a people, we have a very high incidence of asthma. We have a high incidence of high blood pressure. We have a high incidence of heart disease, of diabetes, diabetes. Of, all, yeah. of all of these issues that make us so vulnerable to this virus. I mean, so it's not age we're we're really overall a young people but the real issue is that a lot of us are compromised and we're acting like this is just going to be a flu a catarro you know a monga or whatever it is influenza whatever it is that we call it but it's not this is really a deadly virus particularly when our systems are weakened and we need to talk to all of our communities and make them understand that if you smoke and you get this, you are compromised. Okay. If you have diabetes and you get this, you are compromised. A lot of our tias and abuelas and all uh, love to talk about what? The pills that they take, right? Well, if you're taking a lot of medication, you are compromised. And you are subject then to having not only a bad experience, but a dangerous one. And now you're going to be totally isolated from everybody, right? With, how can you really expect to come back together when we're used to being with people and all of a sudden we find ourselves alone. So we need to know the facts. We need to be responsible for ourselves and we need to be good role models for all the other Latinos and say, no, wear, wear something in your face. No, keep your distance. Don't go play soccer. Don't play football. No, this is not the time to be irresponsible. It's not the time to laugh too loud. This is the time to take our future in our hands. Let other people be irresponsible, but we got to protect our own. And I know that's very well said. And I know Zulai has a question for Nelly Jimenez from Aclamo and 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 because uh, they're on the front lines of servicing our community. Yeah. But before we get Zulai to your questions, Nelly, would, and I have a question for Nelly too. Mm -hmm. um, and, is that to, to just put a five point on what Ida Castro was saying? In my this is my opinion. I think our the struggles we've had as immigrants in the case of of all the other non Puerto Rican Latino communities, in the case most recently or more recently in terms of Puerto Ricans, is that we know how bad things can get, and so you know we're not we don't have any illusions of how 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 serious this can be because we've seen it. In our native countries, that's why so many of you know dealing with very harsh situations. And in the case of Puerto Ricans, you know, we've been dealing with this for the last three years. We know how things, how how serious these 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 crises can be, and we know how my words, not yours, that you know when we don't have the right response from the top leadership, how it can turn it can it can turn a direction that doesn't seem like that's even possible in the United States. Um, so we, I think our I agree with you either. I think our community knows this is serious. And I think that they're just looking, and that's why it's so important that we have people like 
GACLA, the governor's office, that are providing the Latino community culturally competent information in you know, Lodo Idioma for our community. They just need accurate, to your point, they need accurate information. So, Zula, I know you wanted to, to ask uh, Nelly a question around how this work is, um, this crisis impacting her, her, her services. So um, I, I'm always interested to see how people, how um, workplaces, you know, how, how is it that they pivot in a time like this? And I'm really excited. I know, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough moment we're going through right now, but it's exciting the potential that, you know, enterprise and how is it that the workplace is going to be shifting to new ways of doing business and new ways of coming to work. How have you dealt with, with, you know, the changing model in such a short amount of time? Yeah. So on March 11, when uh, we were at the office, I was in a meeting outside and that's when the governor for the first time said, you know, you, you guys have to, you know, all go home, right? And close the non-essential uh, businesses. And I went to Aklamo to the buildings and we went on a frantic trying to distribute food and we did deliveries and I got home very late. Um, a lot of my staff did trying to get that. But I think one of the changes for us is definitely being able to learn about new um, tech technology <laughs> platforms mm -hmm. and how to provide services. But we also have gone through trying to figure out how to best use those platforms and what are the platforms that people really need so it's interactive, right? So there are a lot of things that we have changed and shifted uh, through it. Remember, a lot of the services that we provide, they have to be face-to-face. -face. So even our, our community is struggling right now because the warmth of coming to the building, they don't even have that, right? Like they're, they're safe place. And, and I think that we, w one of the first things that we did, it was like the hotline, right? We created a hotline to be able to serve all of our uh, more than 7,000 people that we normally serve. And what happened is that more people around the community started like how I communicate. So we started thinking in a more global way. How can we mm -hmm. serve more Latinos, no one-on-one, -on -one, because we have to be out there trying to serve everybody we can. So um, around uh, March 18, 19, we started being very active in Facebook. Now, every day in the last two weeks, I have gone at 5 p.m. and I do a Facebook Live. And, yes, and that has yeah. been very, very effective because... A lot of these people know me. They know I'm the executive director. I told them, I always tell them, you know, this is me. This is the face. But I have a bond. To all my staff is behind me and, and all the, the, the services that we provide. So every afternoon we go at five and we have seen how people are so appreciative of seeing someone's face that they know mm -hmm. that is a leader in their community giving them information, sharing resources. So, and I tell them, you know, Telemundo is here and I have worked with Telemundo to do some, of, you know, uh, giving them um, access to that information. They still, it, it, because we are so grassroots, right? In Montgomery County, mm -hmm. in County, they want to see someone that is like them, that talks like them. So I go and, and I think the other thing is that I've been trying to keep calm and compose when I do my my uh, news or when I inform them. I follow every single mm -hmm. press release from the governor every single day. Lose sometimes send 20 hundred <laughs> from all over. So I pick and choose, right? But from the health department perspective, because a lot of our clients feel that the information is flying and they're not getting. So I'm only giving them a summary of the information that is easier for them to understand. And I always tell them every information I share is official, is uh, information that it was it coming from a source that you can trust. And then I do um, the also a summary for our county based on the press releases that our Montgomery County um, chair is doing so we can, um, be, we're able to really 
talk to people about the things that are impacting locally our community. And that includes when there are, have been distribution of food. A lot of the things that Damari mentioned before, we have done too. One of the things that we have also done that is a little bit different, we are doing and, and we're providing interpreters for the testing site. And not only in Spanish, but we have partnered with our Korean community, Chinese community, and Hindi. So we have four languages, and even Cambodia this week, we, we had to pull someone from the Cambodia community. But we want to be able to do that, also provide translations, interpretation services for a lot of our communities. And finally, and as important as everything else, uh, not only providing, of course, the social and emotional, but working with our uh, small businesses. So we have, we develop a new partnership with the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we are going to do a, a, a an, um, very big dine in Latino this weekend. So if you are home and you want to contribute, and if you go to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a website, you can find information, you can register your business there if you are a restaurant, and then we can look into that list and then order for them. And that's a nice way to support our Latino businesses that are suffering right right now through all these crises too. I, I had a follow-up question with Nelly, but I know Dr. Bonilla, so good to see you, Damari. Um, we hadn't been on screen together, had a had a yeah. follow-up as related to virtual services, connecting with people tell, in this new era. <laughs> Absolutely. Good to see you too. I wanted to piggyback on Nelly's conversation about ensuring access to information and digestible information because that's where the virtual component is really an asset at the moment. So it's a challenge in that not everybody has access to internet, particularly in low-income communities, but it's an asset for those that do have access to internet because we're able to di uh, break down the information so they can digest it, but also having that visual component is very helpful so that people see what Nelly said. If she's calm as a leader in the community, that makes me feel calm as well. And that's some of what we've heard in terms of the use of videos. The other thing is that the virtual, the virtual world is not only for meetings and professional work and community resources, but also as we talk about education, the students are now having to go online and learn virtually. In addition to that, families are connected virtually. We had over 40 people on Sunday celebrate my tia's birthday because we were supposed to be at dinner and we couldn't do that, right? And so we came together and it was really funny because one of my titi's video was upside down and somebody else couldn't get on. And so it, it's really pushing us to kind of catch up on technology and understand how else can we connect because it is for our community about that connectedness. So in all of these different spaces, virtual connection is the only way that we can really move forward, right? For all so, the work that everybody's doing. No, absolutely. But I wanted to follow up on that question because I know there's a lot of concerns in the community around with education. I mean, let's keep it real. Mm -hmm. Every school district is different, you know? So some of our kids are getting, got Chromebooks to take home with yeah. them. Some got a big stack of a paper and, you know, maybe you could text the teacher uh, about it. So, mm -hmm. and about, and a lot in between, right? So how, um, what other advice do you have and what kind of resources do we have for our Latino parents um, that maybe are Spanish dominant, maybe are immigrant parents, um, maybe are from mixed status families, who knows, um, that they can access some resources to support them? Because, you know, best case scenario, they're working and there's limitations, right? There's another scenario where they are home, but they don't feel like they have the kind of resource, the tools to help their children through this transition. So. So correct. So when you were offline, that's exactly what I was focusing. On. Okay. Uh, sorry, um, that's what I was focusing on because we have we do have a responsibility to ensure that we're meeting all of our students' needs. And one of the areas that we didn't get to touch on a little bit earlier when I was was talking was the special education community. So when you yeah. have a student who is now virtually and or taking paper home, in addition, there's a language barrier at home. In addition, they don't have access to the internet and or media and all of these other areas of information. In addition, they have special needs. They have an IEP or a 504, um, a, a specific plan that needs to be served. We're now finding that we have to be creative about ensuring that we're meeting those needs. And I want to encourage all of us that are here and all those that are watching, if you have an opportunity to be a voice and an advocate in your community, what 
informal services, whether it takes being somebody that breaks down the information so it's digestible, whether it takes you putting yourself in that position to be the spokesperson and remind those people in education, the administrators, as a school board board member, I have a direct role in that, being sure that I'm having the conversation. One thing that I've been able to do in our school district is review the memos that are going out to families to ensure that there is a cultural lens, that there is a cultural sensitivity, and that the information is digestible so that people understand it. It's not about level of academic or or not, but we do have communities that um, that are dealing with issues of language barriers and that are dealing with issues of even literacy levels. And that's not just the Latino community. And then when you add immigration issues and those fear that people in our community already have, that's elevated. And we need to be sure how are we meeting those needs of our students? And Nelly, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, so so one of the things that we have done, and we have 140 uh, students from our area that we are following up and doing activities and in, in, um, in math and reading. Uh, one of the challenges is, of course, uh, technology. And what we have done is to try to use some of the tools that they're using. So we know that a lot of immigrant families have WhatsApp. So we're using the WhatsApp more than ever. We also are doing videos uh, where we read read stories to the children in videos and videotape and, you know, try to be funny to them and, and send them to them. So we have different tools that we use to try to give them the opportunity to not only keep that connection with us, but learning on a different, on different uh, levels. Um, I think that pa part of it is we are very concerned because a lot of our kids have no computers or access to computers in their home. They are doing their homework to e on their on their phone or the parents' phones. A lot of those yep. phones are pay by the parents 20 minutes 30 minutes yep. and what's going to happen data, not unlimited that's right that's right and and yes we have concas we have done a very big campaign get that but the problem is not only that they pay for the phone to work and if they are not um able to work they're going to have to choose between the 20 dollars to pay for the phone or you know, being able to put food in the table. So now we have started um, a new campaign that is called Todos Comemos, We All Eat, so we can have uh, people, uh, our staff, you know, all the time trying to guide and direct people to get uh, food so they don't have to spend the money on that. But there are a lot of needs. Um, we have a lot of people with the medicine um, that are lacking now money to pay for co-payments. So we, you, you really have to be a very creative in how you communicate with kids, working with the school district, right, and be that voice. So I sent an email today to the school district because they – Ask about, you know, they were like, how can I help you? And I said, you can help me because our kids have no computers. How do you plan to do that? I want to know how the distribution is going to be. What happened with the, so the, you have to use cars. Our families have no cars. So how are you planning to, you know, help them if they have no cars? So I, I think this is the moment that in a nice way, but also being very assertive about what, what your expectations are this is what our families deserve, and this is what I want to see the school district doing on behalf of our kids and our families. Yes, and uh, Priscilla Medina in the chat brings up this question of sort of, you know, uh, why do some kids have, why are there these different levels of resources for our kids? The short answer is this is, it's part of a broader conversation. It's about income inequality in our in our society. And so, this tragedy, this disaster, which is not going away, I know all you smart people understand that this is not a, a four to six week problem. This is an 18 month problem. Um, but that that this is really bringing up these holes in our society around around in food insecurity, around healthcare access, around how, you know, how immig the immigrant population truly lives this second, third class status in our society in all these different ways, Nelly, that you just sort of teed up. And, yeah. and one of the big and one of the big ones is, is these school systems that have neighborhood by neighborhood, school district by school district, much different levels of support for our children. 
this is going to aggravate that, right? This is, this is no joke. Like we were in a bad situation before. This is just going to make it harder for our family. So we knew that our families didn't have computers in the first place. This happened. We didn't even have time to distribute it because this happened from one day to the other. And now we're seeing that. Yeah, if you have um, family, um, in, if you have computer in your house, if you have if your family is bilingual or if your family have English and you have certain resources, your kids are, you know, comfortable in their home and have all the resources. Instead, our, our families are trying to even feed, you know, how can they feed their kids? And, and I think that it's going to be more, um, it's going to get worse. So, so. Now is a, a good way. Many people that haven't been involved, and sometimes I get frustrated. Like if I call on my friends and the people that I work with, why are not they? Why are no? They're not involved on in the things that matter to our community, like including you know, being an advocate when we talk about funding for the schools and the funding for the formula for the funding and what is, where are, where is everybody before, right? So now we have to deal with what is right now, what we're dealing in, in, the, in this moment and try to make the best of it. But we also have to be conscious that this is an issue that it wasn't two months or one year. This is part of the experience of many families from m many years of being poor or, or living in poverty um, and, and be and have inequalities in different areas and with different groups. Yes, either Castro wanted to jump in on that part of the conversation on any, these, these inequalities that are being exposed. Uh, and we've been advocating for these issues for quite some time. Yeah, and, and I think it's not just that they're being exposed, it's, it's really coming to bear, right? So all of them are coming together and they're slapping everybody in the face. Uh, I think that this offers us a unique opportunity to raise the level of advocacy and really get fundamental change. We have a secretary in the state of education who's Latino, and he is the one person that could drive perhaps major and transformational change in how is it the schools are funded and for what. So we need to use this crisis as an opportunity, right, to move forward our concerns in terms of health, right? So much has is being done right now to go into telehealth, right? So COVID-19 has basically blown that up and healthcare systems have gone from maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 appointments a week to a thousand a day. So this has, is going to transform how health is delivered. We need to make sure that we jump on that bandwagon with the Secretary of Health, with the governor, now that we have people that relate to our needs better, not perfect, but better, and say, hey, if you're going to move in that direction, where are the Latino physicians? Where are the Latino caregivers, right, that can speak in Spanish, that can address the telehealth needs of our community? We need to be at the forefront of all of these questions so that every time a big issue arises, our tendency is, ¿cómo lo resolvemos nosotros? But that problem affects a whole bunch of people. And we need to be thinking about el millón, right? So how do we resolve it para el millón que existe y creciendo? So I think that it would be neat if we can start that conversation and bring together additional leaders to help GACLA, to help others, to advocate for transformational change. 
No question about it. And before we ask our panel to give us their final remarks, and we're going to bring July. July is going to be the save in this game because she's going to get the final question uh, to ask everyone on the panel. I did very quickly, Adrian, since you're here. Um, and actually, I know these are either these are questions you've been very involved in for for quite some time. But a lot the relief package very quickly. The package, one of the things we were very concerned about is how it was going to treat and categorize relief to Puerto Rico. And I know this, we've had a Pennsylvania specific conversation. And I think I, I just wanted you to comment on this. So just to give you an example, we actually, it, it actually worked out a little better than we, we could have, than we may have feared, frankly, because for the most part, the territories in Puerto Rico were in, were classified for support, whether it was SNAP benefits or other types of payments, as 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 states were. There were some notable exceptions. I didn't realize this till yesterday, but the majority of of nonprofits in Puerto Rico are not official five one c threes with the federal government. They're only registered with the Commonwealth government, so they're not going to be eligible for the same sort of small business support. So that I'm very concerned about. And uh, apparently, the the SNAP uh, two hundred million dollar. Uh, 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 grant that's being given to the islands about 80% short of the need for the next few months. So there's a lot of things we can return about. Badrian, as an, a Puerto Rican activist based here, um, just your message around this lens of act, Puerto Rican activism, not only for Puerto Ricans in Pennsylvania and, and diaspora, but making sure that we're keeping out to also support the people on the island. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this uh, federal government has been notorious in, in really um, not providing the need and help that for, for many communities, right? Um, and we've seen this throughout. And right now it's the same, same story. Um, it's kind of left to, to the people again to show for themselves that they can't depend on the government um, and you know it is it is a tragedy. It's more that's more a political tragedy. But um, but yeah, it's it's extremely important. We need to make sure that the funding that is supposed to be allocated that it actually gets there, so that it can help people. But then um, I just saw a comment that pop up. The census is also important, and I want to bring that back home. Um, because these are the measures that the federal government also tends to use when it comes to this type of stuff and how much help is going to go. Um, but yes, I'm going to keep it to that. There you go. So July, since the you're the uh, guest, either, please. No, I was just going to support what Adiran just said. The question of the census is crucial. In the fed- and I worked in the federal government. In the federal government, what is not counted does not exist, period. So the numbers and, and the census is used for absolutely everything from who represents you in the federal government to how much money do you get in any level. So that includes federal dollars for education. That includes federal dollars for health. That includes everything, even transportation, housing, everything. So being counted is not just about you saying, ah, well, you know, I'll cooperate. It's not about cooperating. It's about giving back to your community and making sure that your community will get the resources that they need, making sure that those like Nelly, like Damari, like everybody in Gakla, everybody out there in the front lines doing the hard work that wants to advocate on our behalf can demonstrate that we are there, that we exist, that we have the needs, that we know what age brackets we have, that we know what educational needs we will have because the numbers will speak for themselves. And that is crucial. So please, 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 please get everybody you know to fill out that census form, to get online, help people figure out how to do it. It, Yeah, when you're Latino, there, there are all these funky kind of things you got to fill out. But I'll say this, it's the first time I've been able to say that I'm Puerto Rican, that I'm Taina, that I'm Black, and that I'm white. 
because I'm all of that, that I'm female. And so, you know, there are a couple of other things that I wasn't able to say, but then that's okay because you got to keep something for yourself. There you go. So I'm going to ask July to ask a, a question. If every panelist can kind of give us a brief answer to wrap up this show. So Sulai, get ready to ask this, uh, uh, you know, come up with your, your last question for the panel. But just to underline what I either said, this is just one example. There's an estimate that a quarter of every child in K through 12 in this country is Latino. So just imagine if our Latino serving school districts had a, had the equitable resources that they deserve just from the math, how much support our Latino children would have right now. If we just had our fair share, not more, not special favor, just the, the, the amount of uh, just for the, the, the equitable support. For our young people. So to reiterate what y'all are saying, the census is crucially important. Zulai, I know this has been a freewheeling conversation. You came off the bench and provided a lot of support. And uh, we've had a lot of fun in this show. A lot of great, great friends joining the show here. But your last question to the panel. And again, if folks can give some closing remarks as we wrap up this very informative episode of Found in Translation. I feel COVID has, um, has, se ha metido en cada recoveco de nuestra vida. Y si ustedes están comfortable, si se sienten cómodos contestando esta pregunta um, a, lo, a nivel personal, um, ¿cómo el COVID le, les ha afectado mayormente a, ca, a cada uno? Uh, Nelly, let's start with you. Okay. Bueno, so, yo estoy en una situación, yo vivo en Scranton, Pensilvania, ahora yo vivo sola y mi escuela tuvo que cerrar. Eh, no tengo familia en Scranton porque no soy de aquí. Eh, y estoy en una situación donde me paso enfrente de este laptop todo el día en reuniones de Zoom y no tengo una vez se apaga esto. Y estoy en la cuestión de salud. So, estoy viendo todos los datos, estoy viendo todo lo que está pasando, estoy dándole consejos a la gente, estoy dirigiendo estudiantes y dándole consejos a ellos. Y cuando termine el día, estoy aquí sola, pensando, temiendo, ¿verdad? No dejando que nadie entre a mi casa porque no tengo la capacidad de estar desinfectándola todo el tiempo, ¿verdad? No puedo ir a ayudar a gente que necesita ayuda, que yo los conozco, yo estoy bien saludable, gracias a Dios, pero no puedo ir a ningún sitio. Mi hija, su papá tiene el, el virus este, él tiene 70 años, está comprometido, mi hija es asmática y ella no lo puede ir a ayudar. Y el hombre vive solo en Jersey City, la cosa más triste del mundo. Y yo no puedo ir a donde mi hija tampoco a consolarla y a darle un abrazo, nada más que conversar con ella por teléfono y tratar de darle un poco de paz y de tranquilidad porque ella no puede cuidar a su papá. Y yo no la puedo cuidar a ella. Así que esto es muy difícil. Y uh -huh. hay que prevenir que se ponga peor. ¿Ves? Uh -huh. Porque nosotros tenemos que sobrevivir esto. Punto. Y se acabó. Como familia, como independientes, como individuos, pero como comunidad. Nosotros los latinos somos resilient. Tenemos... Esa capacidad, hay gente que ha pasado la seca, la meca y la tontoneca por llegar a este país y darle una mejor vida a sus hijos. Hay que entonces cuidarse para que ese sueño se logre. Dr. Damari, same question for you. How has um, COVID affected you personally? Um... I think she's I think, she I think so. Yeah. Nelly? Nelly? So, so I, I think right now it's very you emotional. Are you asking me? I think she's coming. You're back. You're back, yeah. Damari? Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry, Nelly. Estoy aquí. También puedo contestar en español. Pienso que lo que Ida dijo es importante y es la prevención. Es una, un, una, un tiempo crítico para nosotros pensar más en la prevención que en cualquier cosa, porque esa es la salvación ¿verdad? en este momento. Para mí, me considero bendecida que puedo trabajar de mi casa y tengo... Eh, eh, continuación de trabajo, de empleo en este momento, considerando que hay tantos que no pueden continuar de trabajar y los que sí están continuando están en peligro. En, es, en eso me considero bendecida, pero tratando de manejar el trabajo, la responsabilidad de la comunidad, la junta escolar directiva, GACLA, todos lo, lo, lo los roles que tengo en la cual estoy envuelta y también ayudar a mis niños a aprender y ser maestra de los niños eh, es difícil. Entonces, uh, lo que pensaba mientras Ida hablaba es eh, la, la importancia de no solo la salud física, pero la salud mental. Y para mí he tenido que tener esos momentos de enfoque espiritual, de darme un baño y dejar de checar la noticia y el teléfono y salirme de la computadora unos ratos y tratar de, de, de calmarme mentalmente, emocionalmente para poder seguir siendo líder y seguir siendo una voz a la comunidad y, y ayudar a mi familia porque mi esposo trabaja en nuestra comunidad y en nuestra comunidad es una comunidad cerrada, lo que decimos gated, y él es responsable por proteger nuestra comunidad. Entonces, para también apoyarlo a él que salga a proteger nuestra comunidad. So, gracias por preguntarle eso. Pienso que es importante saber que también nosotros como líderes comunitarios tenemos que navegar la situación muy delicada. Sí, gracias. Eh, so, so, you, I think that right now is, is, is such emotional right? Emotional time, because I feel that when you're a helper, right? And we all are, I think you have a sense of mixed emotions that you have to deal with because you are trying to be safe and you understand that you have to wear the mask first and breathe, but you have a moral obligation with the people you are committed to, right? And, and I think it's, it's always hard to balance that, that balance, but when it's in your face and, and there are people that are already dying every time, every single day when I do the news and I tell my community, these people got infected and these people died. Like I, I'm always thinking about my parents that I haven't seen like in three weeks because my husband um, goes to work every day because he's an essential worker. So, you know, we don't want to have my parents here. Like the, then I have my three kids that they're also going through their emotional, right? Because we have to take, bring two of them from college and they're also dealing with that. So sometimes it's not only about me and my, and my families that I serve outside, but it's like, How can I also support my family in my house mm -hmm. and keep, you know, so, so that's a little bit hard. And then you feel bad because you, you think that you're not doing enough. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that's part of what we all feeling. Um, I think that the, this morning, I don't know why, like I had a very emotional moment and I, I normally try to keep my composure and I'm very organized, but I, I feel like either, like I, Either I always on the phone or here, my board is waiting for me right now. I have a meeting with them at 930 and they're still waiting for me. So, you know, like, and, and my, my daughter said to me today, mom, you're working more than before, right? Because we are putting so many, so many, and then the kids show up in the programs, right? <laughs> so, but I, I just want to, I just want to say that, um, We just have to try to find that balance even more than before, right? And, and try to keep up uh, our spirits, right? For me, I believe in God. So I put my, my hands and my family hands in his hands. And I say, God, guide me to do the best what I, that I can for the people I love and the people in my community that needs me. And it is a big responsibility to bear in your shoulders, to be responsible for Latinos in Montgomery County and Chester County and in Pennsylvania. So I think that we also have to be kind to ourselves too. And I'm not very good in doing it, <laughs> but I, I'm trying. I'm walking every day and from always having dinner with my family and I, I think that's the balance that we that we need to draw. 
Nelly, that was an excellent answer. Before we get to the end, I just want to let you know you are formally excused. Please, I don't want you to you know, you. take care of your <laughs> yes, board, Mama. Yes. But thank, thank you. you so much, Nelly Jimenez from Aclamo. There you go. Representing as always. Thank you, Nelly. Representing as always. So I don't, I don't want to think it will, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to pay back. You know what I'm saying? So Adrian, continue. That was an excellent question. Zula. <laughs> Mira, eh, yo lo voy a hacer en español esta vez. Así que me pareció muy importante lo que dijo Nelly, ¿verdad? Con respecto a ser. Eh, tener en, tenernos a nosotros mismos en consideración ¿no? lo que, el momento por el que estamos pasando lo estamos pasando todos, estamos todos en, en la misma situación y es una situación extremadamente difícil y, y es difícil para personas que, que son líderes, ¿verdad? líderes comunitarios que como bien decía Nelly tienen, o sienten la responsabilidad de, de estar y de, y de y de convocar por sus comunidades y abocar, abogar por sus comunidades y, y diferentes personas. Pero también es extremadamente importante recordar que, que nosotros somos humanos y que, que a la vez que nos preocupamos por, por la comunidad y los vecinos y, y todas las personas que, pues, que, que llevamos en nuestro corazón, también nuestras familias. A mí personalmente, mis papás viven en Puerto Rico, eh, mi, ambos tienen eh, más de 60 años, eh, mi papá es diabético y, tiene, y él tiene que trabajar y todos los días le digo, no, no salgas o tú sabes, mantente alejado de la gente, si no tienes que ver, porque pues me, me, me preocupa eso como, como hijo, ¿no? Y es algo que, que, que está en mí, que en todo momento, siempre que veo algo, ¿verdad? Y, y por eso es... Sabemos que es bien difícil esta, el, el tipo de prevención que tenemos que hacer, ¿verdad? Porque es estar en cuarentena en nuestras casas, solito, eh, como, ¿ves? como dijo Ida, eh, o las personas que son afortunadas de tener una familia, pues estar 24-7 con la familia, que, que puede ser un montón, ¿verdad? Es, es muchísimo trabajo. También, eh, pero esa es la única manera de salvar a a nuestros familiares, de salvar a nuestras comunidades y de protegerlos, ¿verdad? Y, y es como yo digo, yo quiero que mis papás vivan, ¿verdad? Y estén aquí mucho más tiempo conmigo porque todavía están muy jóvenes. Pero para que eso suceda durante este momento, yo necesito que, que personas como yo, personas como nosotros, se queden en su casa, ¿verdad? Incluyéndolos a ellos. Y, y va a ser difícil, pero, pero tenemos que tener en consideración que estamos todos en las mismas, y, y que lamentablemente es lo que tenemos que hacer si no queremos que esta situación también nos cueste muchísimas vidas y que dure el doble o el triple de lo que esperamos que dure, ¿verdad? Así que es una, es una responsabilidad inmensa que, que de momentos se le tiró a todo el mundo, le cayó encima a todo el mundo y todos tenemos que actuar con, con responsabilidad y, y con esa urgencia, ¿verdad? De que me estoy protegiendo a mí, pero también ustedes están protegiendo a mis papás, ustedes, yo estoy protegiendo a sus papás, a mis abuelitos y, to, y todo eso. You know, the, the, this is why I do the show, is that I've always felt, and I think I shared it with you all sort of individually over the years, is that I've always felt on some level a little selfish or a little guilty because I've been so fortunate to connect with people all over the country in my organizing work with people like that are on the screen right now. And the, and the mission ultimately of the show, obviously there's political analysis and I get excited about certain political topics. I like to share with people, mm -hmm. but the reason ultimately I do the show is because we got to share the perspective and the leadership, not just of, in the Latino community, but I mean, this whole country, this whole world with people like we got on the screen and look, either God, so she, that's, this is a legend we got to build. I mean, let's keep it real. This is a legendary, figure in our community and you deserve all the flowers and all the love that you get. You know that Adrian, he's a rising star. He's the boy wonder of Philly. Everybody knows <laughs> he's, he's doing big things. So impressive guy. And Damari, I got to say this. It's so funny. Cause I know I, I should refer to you as Dr. Bonilla Rodriguez, but you know, how Damari lives in the, in the boondocks now, you know, so I don't see her that much, but I'm always reminded when I connect with you two or three times, you're like, Goyo Damari is so good. She is so sharp. So you need to keep coming on the show. We need to keep working. Yeah. We got to just find excuses, Damari, keep collaborating. Yes, anytime. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, because you you're so talented. And obviously, in July, let me tell you, 
you really stepped it up today. I really appreciate it because, you know, I get so excited about so many big things around here. And Zulai, thank you for bringing the, the show back to what it needed to end with, which was how this is such a personal situation. And yeah. unfortunate, the, the ble- one of the blessings of this tragedy, and I say tragedy because we're going to lose so many people and it's going to, I just got a text, a friend of mine who, Either you know the family, Brooklyn, Boricuas, they just, two people are sick now and it's throwing everything off. So this is just a constant, this is not going away for a while. But one of the silver linings here is that we were able to ground ourselves in what really matters. In July, that's what you grounded us to end this conversation. So July Piccarelli, my co-host, I want to thank you. Ida Castro, yo la bendiga, you know how much we care about you. You know, we could just do this goofing around. We don't have to tape it. Let's just keep in touch. (laughs) Adrian, you know, the last public appearance I had before the this isolation was Adrian and a bunch of our friends and family went and go watch the basketball game together. You know, we're we're friends first. And Dr. Damari Bonilla Rodriguez, you know we are family. Let's keep working together and we need to keep this education conversation going and you're gonna be a big part of that. Thank you all, familia, especially the marathoners that watch this nearly two hour show. Um, <laughs> this will be podcast as a separate episode because those were two incredible conversations. My Marianela Agosto y Teresa Charan. Thank you so much for teeing off the special series we're going to have on autism awareness. We got to support these kids and the, and their loved ones. Thank you so much for joining Found Translation. Y felicidades. Gracias. Thank Gracias. you. Dios los bendiga.